Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, check-ins. Um, I'm a little uh, tired, a uh, little calm, and uh, ready. And I see Ben just arrived, so hello, Ben. We're doing. A, we're just. Uh, we're just starting. Um, so welcome to the Stoa. My name is Peter Lindbergh. I'm the steward of the Stoa, and the Stoa is a place for us to go here and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this moment. Um, and today we had. Uh, just naturally emerge at the STOA. So at the STOA, for those of you who are here for the first time, we have a couple of different types of events. We have a wisdom gym where we, we practice sort of uh, psychotechnologies, transformational technologies like meditation, um, you know, uh, shame breakthrough, Socratic speed dating. We have existential dance parties. So like a little bit on the jazzy side. And then we have kind of Q&A type sense making type sessions, which would fall, this session would fall into that bucket. And for whatever reason, uh, a couple of events uh, fell on this day that were related to Jordan Peterson. And um, full disclosure, Jordan Peterson was a, uh, my former therapist before he became uh, famous. And so I thought, hmm, why don't we just like slap the, the word symposium on this, uh, which uh, like this week feels a little tone deaf right now based off what's happening in America. But um, since we had things um, already scheduled, I thought we would run through it with, with care and sensitivity to what is happening in the world right now. And so in this particular session, we have um, the authors of Myth and Mayhem, a leftist critique of Jordan Peterson. And um, what's going to happen, they're going to kind of talk for seven minutes each, share their, their ideas, their opinions on the book, uh, and then we're going to pivot to a QA. and a um, And I will put their website in the, the chat box if you don't know it. The Zero Books published in Zero Books is an excellent publisher. I, I, I love them a lot. Uh, Michael Brooks, who was on the show, uh, the store recently, he had a book there. Angela Nagel's Kill All Normies, uh, Mark Fisher's Capital, Capitalist Realism. Uh, a lot of good books from Zero Books. I would definitely check that out. So that being said, um, speakers will speak. And then if you have any questions, just write in the chat box while they're speaking. And then when the Q&A portion happens, I will call on you to ask your question. So uh, if anyone would just like to go first, I don't know what the order is, just maybe introduce yourself and then maybe you can jump into your, your, your seven minutes. Okay, uh, I think we said we're gonna go in the order the essays were written, right? Yeah, that's good, yeah. Okay, um, so that would be me first and then we'll go on to Conrad uh, and then Marion and then Ben. Uh, last but not least, Ben, of course. Um, and I should mention actually, uh, one of the new classics for the Zero Line is actually uh, Professor Burgess's Give Them an Argument Logic for the Left. Uh, which is not just a really good book in and of itself, but actually a really nice um, manual or introduction to logic. So if you get a chance, you should take a look at that. Um, so one of the reasons why I decided to write the book was um, I was doing my PhD uh, at York University around the time when Peterson started to really ascend um, to the stratosphere of fame. And like a lot of people in Toronto uh, at the time uh, who were also involved in academic intellectual circles, uh, I was really surprised by this, right? Uh, you know, you're kind of used to writing obscure academic articles and having them be read by two, three hundred people, and every now and then, uh, you know, somebody will appear on the CBC to talk about their area of expertise, uh, but nowhere near the kind of attention this figure was getting uh, in major outlets like the National Review or CBC or Channel Four in the United Kingdom. Uh, and so, like a lot of people, I was just intrigued uh, to figure out what his work was about. Uh, and in particular, since I kind of broadly associate uh, with a left liberal political tradition, uh, arguing for social redistribution of wealth and so on, um, I wanted to kind of see what all the fear was about on that angle as well. Uh, and when I went through Maps of Meaning uh, for the first time in 2017, about mid-2017, right after I finished my degree, uh, what really struck me was how much consonance there was between Peterson's own account of modernity uh, and a lot of the more overtly reactionary critiques uh, of modern life that you found in many of the theoretical figures that he drew upon. People like Friedrich Nietzsche, Carl Jung, or Martin Heidegger. Uh, and what surprised me was actually how little deviation there actually was in his own account of modernity uh, and a lot of what these figures were saying. Uh, you know, there were some novel uh, innovations that he made, certainly psychologically, and bringing them up to date uh, using you know, the best kind of scientific literature that was available in the 1990s. Uh, but there was nothing that Peterson was really arguing 
uh, against modern life, or for that matter, against the contemporary left uh, that would have been obscure to Heidegger or even someone like Nietzsche. Uh, and this made me start to think that there might be space to develop a left-wing critique uh, of Peterson uh, that resembled many of the left-wing critiques uh, that were developed of these figures at earlier points. Uh, particularly in the back of my mind, Adorno's critique of Heidegger uh, came to mind. Uh, Adorno famously castigated Heidegger for saying, you think modern life is rubbish and it's all the fault of technology and cultural changes, uh, but nowhere do you really speak that much about the influence of capital, modern machinery, modern media, and so on and so forth. Uh, everything kind of operates at this highly idealized level. Um, and so that was the genesis of the book back in 2017, uh, where I just started to come up with a few different ideas of what it was that I wanted to say on this point, uh, did a deep dive into a lot of Peterson's writing uh, and the writing around him. Um, and I started to publish a series of articles um, for small outlets like Ariel, Marilyn, or Marion West. Uh, there were one or two in Colette uh, that weren't directly about Peterson, but referred to him. Um, that kind of got the critique going a little bit. Uh, and what really surprised me was people were very receptive to this. There was real hunger uh, for a more sustained critique of his work from a left-wing perspective uh, that took his ideas seriously without treating them uh, like idols, right? Like they should be beyond contestation. Uh, and at that point, what I figured is that I didn't want to do this alone since I certainly don't have the area of expertise necessary to speak on all the different dimensions of his work, uh, which is why our other co-authors got on board, uh, Conrad Hamilton to write on this from a Marxist perspective, uh, Marion Trejo to write on this from a feminist perspective, and then Ben, uh, who's just um, an excellent scholar when it comes to the structure of argumentation uh, being a logician. Uh, and my own contribution in the book uh, was mainly to criticize Peterson along two dimensions. Uh, one was, again, the inherent problems that one finds in any modernist uh, right-wing critique of, much, uh, like, of contemporary life, uh, as I called it. Uh, and again, I don't want to imply that uh, I didn't draw on some important inspiration here. People like Adorno and Horkheimer uh, were really important in framing my own criticisms of their work. Uh, but one of the things that I said is that I believe that Peterson is right, that in many senses, modern life does have a problem. Um, there's a great sense of desolation uh, and people feel a tremendous lack of meaning in modern and now postmodern uh, life that we need to find a solution for. Uh, the problem that I had with Peterson, of course, uh, was that much like Heidegger and Nietzsche of yore, uh, nowhere does he actually account for how capital uh, might play a role in generating this sense of anime and this sense of meaninglessness. Uh, and I think it's actually extremely important to take note of this, uh, since as far back as Marx and Engels, uh, writing in the Communist Manifesto, where they pointed out that under capitalist conditions, all that is solid melts into the air, people were away about of how traditionalist and sacred forms of life were being absolutely corroded uh, by processes of industrialization and capitalization, uh, and that this was going to remake the world uh, in many ways for the better, uh, but also in many ways uh, for the worst, because people would now not have a sense of stability uh, on which so many of us depend for our sources of self, uh, and that earlier generations were more easily able to avail themselves are, than uh, people in modernity and now postmodernity. And the other thing that I criticized Peterson for uh, was on a more constructive dimension, uh, arguing that he likes to characterize himself uh, variously as kind of classical liberal. Uh, I think even more correctly uh, would be situated uh, as what's sometimes called an ordered liberty conservative, uh, which has a tradition going back to people like Edmund Burke. Uh, and I said, I actually don't think this kind of ordered liberty approach to liberalism and freedom and equality is appropriate. Uh, what I actually think that we need to do uh, is establish something like a Rawlsian liberal socialist state uh, where we don't talk about meritocracy or hierarchies of competence without establishing genuinely fair conditions of opportunity for everyone. Uh, according to something like the difference principle or another egalitarian principle of distribution. Uh, and one of the things I pointed out is that nowhere in his lengthy screeds about competence hierarchies uh, does he anywhere talk about the fact that for many contemporary liberal authors, uh, you can't just have unbridled capitalism. Liberalism actually demands a very serious redistribution of wealth to provide uh, opportunities for everyone. And if you don't do that, you have no right to actually call yourself a liberal state. Uh, and I put a little bit of pressure on him in that respect at the end of the book, uh, but I'm almost out of time. So if people want to ask questions about that, I'll be happy to take that later on. So I think it's Conrad's turn.
Yeah, it's interesting about uh, what Matt said uh, about uh, Peterson's liberalism, uh, because that became, you know, sort of from a Marxist standpoint, uh, a significant point of investigation uh, for me. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think what intrigued me about the project is the fact that responses to Jordan Peterson are so uh, totally divisive, right? Um, so on one side, you see him portrayed as, uh, uh, you know, an unrepentant chauvinist, if not fascist, uh, whose evolutionarily tinged self-help philosophy reprises the worst prejudices of Carl Jung's pseudoscientific mysticism. And on the other, often you see him portrayed as a benign liberal conservative, whose calls for men and women alike to toughen up uh, represents a welcome corrective to decades of overstretching by meddlesome progressives. Uh, and I think that um, what's interesting about this is that, you know, there's a certain truth uh, to both of these, these images. Um, what I'll refer to as sort of the exoteric and esoteric images of Peterson. Um, I mean, 12 Rules for Life has sold uh, 3 million copies. So I think it's safe to say that not everyone who bought it is, you know, marching around with tiki torches, throwing Zeke Hales. Um, but, you know, I think it's similarly, it would be also disingenuous to say that um, Peterson's only modus operandi is like to tell disaffected men to make their beds, which probably most women would be happy about really. Um, because if that were the case, he would have never become a crucible for activists at the University of Toronto. Um, you know, he never would have been valorized by the right wing media the way he was, and he never would have ultimately attracted the rabble of the alt right. But in my account, I actually zone in on um, an interesting episode that occurred. And I discuss a lot of things th throughout my part of the book, but I'm just going to focus on this a bit. Uh, I discussed something that happened at, at Lafayette College, uh, and there was an interesting question uh, Peterson was posed about uh, race and IQ. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not here to try to crucify Peterson for, you know, violating the tenets of political correctness, but I actually think it's important in terms of clarifying his larger sort of ideology. Um, so when he's asked a question about the fact that certain races have different IQs um, and, and what he thinks about the validity of the science, Peterson of, of, of at first sort of hesitates. He says, you know, I don't like answering this, this kind of question because it means you'll get, you get killed, right? Um, but of course, Peterson being Peterson, uh, he does uh, give a response. Uh, and, you know, there's a kind of misdirection that's involved in his response uh, because, and this is very characteristically Peterson, he sort of digresses uh, into a discussion about uh, the public misapprehension of statistics. Uh, so he points out that often when we read statistics, what we don't understand is what he calls the tail problem, right? So the way that if you take even one standard uh, deviation of difference, uh, in IQ, right? So Ashkenazi Jews, for example, one standard deviation uh, of difference in terms of IQ higher than other groups, this will really manifest extremely uh, at the high end of the spectrum. So there'll be a lot of Ashkenazi geniuses. You know, and then he talks about how, uh, you know, even the US military uh, won't hire individuals with IQs under 83, which is about 10% of the population. Um, and cites this is, this is evidence that, you know, as a society, we need to sort of find something to do with these people. Um, now, it's interesting, right, because in this lecture, uh, questions about IQ being a consequence of socialization are mostly swept under the rug on the grounds that IQ is the best thing we have, right? Um, but then at the end, you see this very, very characteristic move by Peterson, um, which is that, you know, having said all of this, um, you know, he says that, you know, but just because people have different IQs doesn't mean that they have a different intrinsic value as human beings. Um, and I think if we examine this, it can help us really get to the bottom of Peterson's views. Peterson describes himself as a classical British liberal. Um, but if we're going to, you know, quibble with this characterization, one thing we can say is that, you know, within the liberal tradition, there's a sort of qualified focus on the importance of egalitarianism, right? You see this in Mill, Smith, etc. Even Thomas Hobbes thought everyone basically had the ability to kill each other, which judged by Peterson's, re Peterson's reference to the military, uh, he might be skeptical about. Um, but really, if you look at Peterson's views, egalitarianism, you know, he insist, well, we could say, you know, liberalism, egalitarianism, um, these sort of ideas, for him, they don't speak to the ontological structure of reality, right? They're really just kind of fictions, albeit important ones, right? And if we want to understand this kind of disarticulation, I think we have to look at how, uh, you know, Jung, uh, Jung said that, you know, I'm an inveterate Democrat, uh, but I believe nature is aristocratic and esoteric. Uh, so for Peterson, nature, which is, there's a sort of structural affiliation with the unconscious, is largely autarkic, 
right? Now we see this in the first chapter of 12 Rules for Life, stand up straight with your shoulders back, for example, uh, when he says, it's a winner, it's winner take all in the lobster world, just as it is in human societies, where the top 1% have as much loot as the bottom 50%, and where the richest 85 people have as much as the bottom three and a half billion. And for Peterson, this affords proof of how Price's law holds in nature, dictating uh, differential production or the necessity of differential production. Now, this has an implication for how Peterson perceives capitalism, um, because in a certain way, Peterson doesn't support capitalism in spite of its inequality. He supports it because of its inequality. Now, he would never say, of course, I like inequality. Um, but the point here is that in Peterson's system, if you attempt to diverge from this uh, naturalized inequality, um, you know, what can happen very easily is that you lapse into totalitarianism, right? And this totalitarianism, or this sort of, is, is in turn feminized uh, due to its relationship with, you know, left side of the brain, meta archetype of feminine chaos, devouring mother, and so on. If we really get into the, the structure of Peterson's work. But, but I think this really gets to the problem of it, right? Which is because um, if you don't buy the way that he marries Jungian archetypal, archetypal structures to evolutionary psychology, which is a rickety intellectual edifice to be sure, none of it really holds water, right? So he'll, for example, like uh, he'll, he'll cite it's often a very dubious study by Stuten Geary um, that shows how uh, women in gender equal nations, relatively gender equal nations like in Scandinavia are less likely to study uh, STEM fields. Um, and you know, like the thing is, even if that, if, even if that were true, um, Peterson draws a sort of peculiar conclusion from this, which is that, uh, you know, this owes to inherent biological differences and that the biological basis of this is crystal clear. This sort of thing would only make sense if you accepted the idea that Sweden or Norway are so gender equalized that the only deviation in interest in STEM fields between men and women, um, you know, that they have to reflect biological substructures. But this is kind of an odd conclusion to reach given that there were very few women doing STEM even in these countries like 50 years ago. Right? Um, and so I think, again, we see this, I'm just being very schematic here, you know, I, hopefully maybe in the questions we can elaborate a little bit. But I think, you know, you have to sort of understand this conscious, unconscious, exoteric, esoteric divide in Peterson's work. Um, and I think this actual division between a kind of exoteric embrace of liberalism and an esoteric belief in a deeply autarkic image of nature explains how he's popular both with the alt-right and the mainstream. Um, because while he disagrees with the conclusions reached by the alt-right, his severe naturalization of inequality also affords uh, a kind of affiliation to their worldview. Uh, and in a way then, I think, you know, we could say that uh, the alt-right is kind of akin to Peterson's own Jungian shadow, right? An unconscious aspect of his personality, uh, which the conscious ego doesn't identify with. Um, and considering on, for Peterson's own professed disdain for hypocrisy, can we really blame some of his followers for taking, take, taking his ideas to what seems to be their apotheosis? Um, if individuals such as those in the alt-right are Peterson's shadow, this much is clear. He casts a long shadow over them, too. Uh, yeah, that's my presentation. Hi, everyone. And uh, thanks for, for the invitation. Uh, my, uh, my section was uh, an attempt of a critique, I guess, from a more feminist stand, uh, standpoint. And also, uh, at the very end, I kind of try to point out Peterson's hypocrisy when talking about uh, women's issues and especially like as like of course uh, activists that advocate right for the advancement of, of women in the society. Um, the reason why like uh, I'm not Canadian right and I knew very little about Peterson uh, by the time Matt kind of started to to dwell into his thought but one of the reasons I I'm a I, bad influence. <laughs> I decided to go into this was because when I start uh, engaging with Peterson's public, um, uh, like, yeah, like his interviews, etc. like what I saw was a very similar way of talking about feminism against feminism, of course, than the, a very similar what you will see in Mexico, for example, when I'm from 
from very conservative and reactionary people there. So what kind of uh, interested me was why is it like, right, like what's happening or what's going on, right, about these issues that people from very dissimilar backgrounds, right, like kind of um, think sim in similar ways, right, about uh, feminism. So that was like my motivation. Um, and what I wrote was basically like a uh, first or my, my section is divided in four points. First, I wanted to address his anti-feminism, how he basically uh, hides this truly anti-feminist position uh, by saying that he's only against the radical feminism. So I try to, to dwell a little bit on how that's not true. He's actually an anti-feminist just in disguise. Uh, the second part of like, like my second point I made was about how he uses tyranny and he compares feminism with tyranny, right? And he compares like some of the like, uh, uh, conquest like all sorts of feminists have done over the years with basically tyranny so what i said there was uh, firstly that um it's a it's a weird a weird critique the one that he makes because he kind of says that feminists are tyrants right in uh, sometimes or implies that feminists are tyrants because the problem my problem with Peterson at least is that he is unclear enough so you can draw some cons like some conclusions from his thought but also at the same time he could like distance himself by saying oh i didn't say that right like he kind of leads you in a way or that's my the way i see it and i think uh, i I've, I've heard ben like express this sentiment at some point and elsewhere right like he kind of points somewhere but when you go there he says oh no i wasn't really pointing there right so, but, my, but what I say is that, or, or reading other, other like other texts, uh, other of his texts, like what I say is he kind of talks of this tyranny in the sense of like a government, almost like a government apparatus, right? It's not run from the government, of course, but that it's like almost like as his, his social justice movements, including feminism there, right? Like I have these very tyrannical, like, or operated in like this like mechanism of tyranny, right? So I criticize that by uh, saying why I do think he's wrong. Uh, my third critique has to do with like hierarchy as, a, uh, as Conrad and Matt already mentioned, right? How um, like when he speaks of like hierarchies in, right, of course, when it has to do with gender and sex, like, uh, he misle misleads us like in a lot of ways. My first issue was that he says that when like biology, like evolutionary biology, for example, uh, basically says, right, how like uh, males tend to be in the way Peterson characterized them, right, or are top of the hierarchy because of their sex. Uh, traits and what I did was dispute this because actually there's no consensus in evolutionary biology uh, about this hypothesis, right? It's, it's remain a hypothesis and uh, that's not true. And finally, what I wanted to point out is the hypocrisy, right? Because Peterson, like, uh, kind of is against this victimization culture, right? Like, oh, you shouldn't be a victim. Like, this is the whole problem with feminists, right? Like, they want to frame themselves as victims and uh, this is wrong because you have to, like what he says basically, right? Like make your bed and just appropriate, like kind of take responsibility of yourself, right? So I pointed out how this is very hypocritical because when he talks about the effects that what he sees feminists have done to men, he certainly speaks of men in a very, like from, as if men were the victims, right? The victims of these bad feminists and like, uh, and look at all these like sad men, right? Like most of what happened is not only what Matt said, right? Like modernity and these like, um, the problems with capitalism, etc. But it, to me, it seemed that he also blames, of course, what is happening to men mostly to like, uh, it blames it or he pins it on feminism, right? So I wanted to address how he, just is very selective on use this victim rhetoric when 
like denying this victimhood to women, uh, but he's very willing to give this label to men. So that was like, those are like the general things that I, I talk in my section. Okay. I think, uh, Ben, you're our last speaker. Uh, last but not least, as I always say. All right, great. Uh, so I guess the way that I originally, well, actually, uh, in a way, um, everything that I'm doing right now is, is thanks to Jordan Peterson. So thank you for that, Dr. Peterson. Um, because a few years ago, uh, what I was doing um, with, with my time was um, writing academic papers about uh, philosophy of logic, which, you know, um, as Matt said, you don't really expect anybody to read. And, uh, and then also spending far too much of my time arguing with members of my extended family who are fans of Jordan Peterson. Uh, and this, this led me uh, when, when my friend Doug Lane, who's the uh, editor of Zero Books, was organizing a couple of years ago a, uh, a conference. It was, uh, it was called uh, Jordan Peterson, a conference in lieu of a debate because uh, Doug had invited Peterson to be on his uh, the Zero Books podcast and Peterson had initially taken the invitation and then he realized um, that it was going to be ideologically hostile territory, so he canceled the interview. Um, about a couple weeks before going on Joe Rogan, and Rogan said, hey man, why, why don't you ever have a debate with one of these equality of outcome Marxists? And, uh, and Peterson said, oh, because they don't want to talk to me. Uh, so, um, so, so Doug organized this conference, and since I had been spending a lot of time thinking about uh, Peterson just for the purpose of, you know, arguing with relatives of mine, you know, who, uh, who are much more enamored with him than I am, uh, I, um, I, I said, hey, I'd, I'd like to, you know, I'll submit an abstract to the conference. And he said, actually, I was thinking maybe you'd like to write this other book for us. And he laid it, you know, he sort of pitched to me the idea of the first book that I wrote for them and everything's kind of followed from that. Uh, but I want to talk just briefly, uh, you know, what, you know, some of, um, I think one, one way to start this would be to connect to something that's already come up with both Conrad and Matt's uh, presentations, which is Peterson's relationship to classical liberalism. So, uh, so my, you know, my perspective on this, uh, since uh, some thinkers like, like, you know, Kant, uh, David Hume, who are very much in the classical liberal tradition or certainly people who are academic interests of mine, I've taught classes about. Uh, and so when I, when I see anybody, right, uh, say in 2020, I'm a classical liberal, I get very confused by that uh, because my, my perspective is, is that it's not so much that Peterson is a classical liberal or he isn't a classical liberal as the very idea that classical liberalism names a contemporary political position is slightly bizarre. Uh, if you go back and look at the actual normative and political views of people like Locke or Kant, uh, they bear no resemblance to anything that anybody, like right, libertarian, centrist, anybody thinks today in terms of a lot of their specific views on subjects like um, slavery and, and, uh, and race relations. Uh, but they do bear some, you know, the resemblance they bear is one that's to every contemporary position, right? So, um, so on the one hand, nobody is a classical liberal today any more than anybody is a young Hegelian or a member of the Jacobin Club today. Uh, the sort of the issues that define classical liberalism uh, refer to a world that no longer exists. You know, capitalism arising out of feudalism and reacting to feudal institutions and church power and all of those things. Uh, but on another level, everybody today is a classical liberal. The basic assumptions of classical liberalism are part of the DNA of everything from libertarianism to Buckleyite conservatism to Marxism. Um, you know, you could talk about a broad sense of philosophical liberalism, like what Rawls talks about, you know, which, uh, which sort of starts from the assumption that everybody has equal moral worth. Uh, but uh, that's a, but, you know, that's not, you know, but that's not specific to classical liberalism, right? That's even broader. All right. Um, so, so what do I think Peterson's political position is? Um, well, I don't think he's a fascist, right? You know, I, I think that would be, that would be a silly thing to say. 
Uh, but there's also, I think, from what my perspective is, an equally silly thing people you say. You didn't disturb time. I get you, but you Oh, okay. Uh, what I think is an equally think silly thing that uh, that many people say uh, is uh, is oh, Peterson is is like, you know, you know, he's a psychologist. He's a he's a self help author. Why are you, you know, giving him a hard time about his political or philosophical uh, pronouncements? Uh, because, of course, uh, he's primarily famous because of his political pronouncements. Uh, he originally rocketed to fame because of his crusade against uh, C-16 to add gender identity to Canada's uh, pre-existing human rights law. Uh, and he interpreted that in a way that's, I think, extremely legally dubious. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I don't live in Canada themselves, but myself, but uh, Matt assures me that there are, that no one has been sent to a pronoun gulag just yet. Um, but in any case, uh, he constantly talks, even in his self-help book, he talks a lot about so-called postmodern Marxism um, and, uh, and these trends that he generally opposes. Uh, and, and I guess I'd like in the last minute, you know, my remarks, uh, and we can get more into this in the Q&A, to say uh, just a little bit more about that, which of course takes us back to the overall issue of hierarchy. Right, so and I saw this came up in uh, in the chat. Right, so is is Peterson making a purely descriptive claim about hierarchy, or is he also making a normative claim? And I'd say a little bit of each. So uh, his descriptive claim is that hierarchy is natural and you know um, is natural and and not and not social. That it it, it comes from um, it comes from our biology. Uh, you know, it's 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 embedded in these deep archetypes. Uh, but then his normative claim is, therefore, when you try to mess with it, uh, you're, that's, that's just a misguided effort. It's like trying to make water flow up. Uh, so, then, um, so, then you, um, so then you're going to lead to all kinds of bad results. And as you try to, you know, quality of opportunity, okay, but as you try to enforce equality of outcome, which he clearly associates with Marxists, feminists, etc., uh, you are by meddling with uh, these things that are etched into the firmament uh, by trying to meddle with those, you know, you're on a straight road to um, to repression because when you try to change human nature, you can only end uh, with uh, with with the gulag, right? I mean, this this isn't even really a caricature. I mean, he kind of says this. I can point you to some specific videos where he kind of says this. And I know I'm at my seven minutes, but I'll I'll just I'll just wrap up on this point to circle back to the very first thing Peter said at the beginning about, uh, you know, how in a way it seems sort of tone deaf. And of course, in a way, in a way to even, you know, talk about Peterson, have, you know, symposium on Peterson uh, as, as we're seeing everything that we're seeing. And I feel that too, but in a way I feel the opposite. That at a time when uh, we're seeing a unprecedented level of civil unrest, uh, largely by impoverished people sparked by state violence. Uh, I, in a way, I actually can't imagine a more relevant time to delve into the issue of whether existing social hierarchies are natural and inevitable, uh, or whether they are contingent and we'd better off be better off doing it at least without quite a few of them. Great, thank you, Ben. Um, just to confirm for the, the four speakers, do we have you for um, like uh, 75 minutes or is it the hour that uh, we have to head out? Oh, so 75 minutes is cool with me. I guess that would bring us to 530. So. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's good. fine. Good. We, we usually go for an hour here, but there looks like there's a lot of uh, questions and there's speak more speakers than one. So I will go for, for the 75 minutes. So a lot of questions in the chat box, uh, just a few things. Um, this will be recorded. So if you don't want to be on camera, uh, just ask me to read it on your behalf and I will. Um, and I'm gonna have the heuristic. You can have one follow-up question, um, and that's it. Um, and I will climb the dominance hierarchy and kick you out of the Zoom call if you uh, break these protocols. Um, and just, you know, let's just be polite here because I know the Peterson gets triggered, people get triggered on all sides of the uh, spectrum when, when he comes up. So for the first question, uh, Max, uh, you got a question, you had a bunch of plus ones about it. If you can um, unmute yourself and read it. Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> let me go back to it. I ask a question regarding what Conrad said, and the question is, where does Peterson actually state that inequality is good? 
or implies that he supports cap capitalism because it deepens or reinforces inequality. And then I added that my take on it is that he's merely um, laying out what he believes are the facts of inequality and not making a value judgment about whether or not such facts are good or if he agrees with those facts. Rather, he's, at least in my understanding of it, simply laying it out as he perceives it. Uh, yeah, well, you know, I mean, part of what we're doing here is trying to understand the philosophical structure of Peterson's work, right? You know, not, not simply to extract quotations, right? Um, you know, I mean, I think that uh, it's entirely inherent to the structure of what he's doing, right? That there's a normative aspect. And this is what Ben was touching upon, right? Um, because, you know, if you look at what he's attempting to achieve in Maps of, Maps of Meaning, right? Um, you know, he's attempting to uh, rationalize uh, Jungian archetypes, right? Which is a kind of cosmology of gender, if we look at psychoanalysis, um, you know, with respect to neurobiology, right? Um, you know, and, and, and it's, part of, it's partly this, this tension between um, normative and, and descriptive um, you know, that allows Peterson to evade questions about this kind of thing, right? Um, but what's very, very clear, like, like the thing is, and I, where I think your question is interesting is I think that there's a certain amount of flexibility in Peterson's work, it is true, uh, in terms of uh, how we could improve the world, right? So when he uses these terms, like, for example, uh, you know, equality of opportunity versus equality of outcome, I mean, like, in, in reality, there's almost no one on the left who's ever really defended equality of outcome. Right? Even Karl Marx doesn't defend that, right? Um, you know, he criticizes class inequality specifically, but acknowledges that people have, you know, different virtues and, you know, there are likely to be hierarchies that emerge on that basis, right? Um, so there's an amorphousness, right, with respect to this. Um, and so, so, again, my point here is what does it mean, right? Equality of opportunity versus equality of outcome, right? Um, you know, is our current system one that's defined by equality of opportunity? Right? I mean, if, obviously, if you're impoverished in, in Africa, you don't have a quality of opportunity, right? So he moves in this very, very vague terrain. But what is clear about his work, right, uh, is that, um, you know, the, uh, if you push hard against, right, if you push for what he, what he deigns very vaguely, right, as a quality of outcome, um, that this can lead to uh, deeply dangerous results, right? And this is based on a naturalization of inequality, right? Um, so I believe you commented also that uh, you said, um, you said, uh, let's see here. Was, was it here? You said, uh, anyway, you were, you were commenting that it's not necessarily, or someone was commenting that it's not necessarily him saying that, that he's drawing on, you know, other sources to say that, right? But the point is that he actually structures it philosophically, right? So because there's uh, an ontological inequality that's inherent to nature. And I think the first chapter of, of 12 Rules for Life is his most succinct statement of that, though it can be found elsewhere, right? We have to respect that inequality, right? And we have to develop systems of government that are representative with respect to it, right? And that if we diverge too far from that, right? That there's potentially going to be very, very dangerous and catastrophic results, right? And that, that's actually the structural role that the notion of totalitarianism plays in his work, right? It's something that emerges right, when you go too far in the direction of equality of outcome, right, um, you know, and then it ex exerts this kind of crushing weight as a response to that. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. But then my follow-up question would be, if I'm allowed, that I, I don't really see in Peterson that it's a necessary conclusion that the only, if you, if you follow them logically, they will take you necessarily to these extreme right-wing and destructive um, but interpretations, because precisely in Maps of Meaning, I, at least it's what I, I understood when I read it, and I consider myself a leftist, is that mm -hmm. he, he tries to lay out the structure that leads to positive change in society. That's part of what is contained within mythological and religious structures. Like the spirit of change, he insists, he insists on the idea that through changing yourself, you can change society and all that stuff. But I didn't. I really didn't see this idea that you shouldn't try to change things. It, it was closer to you should be serious and responsible in trying to change things, because doing it prematurely or too quickly or without seriousness can lead to those kinds of distortions. And so my 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 main problem with it is that the. He isn't really, in my understanding, he isn't really trying to justify inequality. He's, he, he's 
in some ways doing precisely the opposite. He's trying to say, if you want to change it, then you have to be serious about it. And that's, I, I really don't see how that's, uh, it, yeah. it's, it's like the interpretation that you were saying strikes me as being opposite to what he's actually stating. Okay. Well, the first thing to say is that I didn't say that, um, you know, uh, that Peterson's positions are, are far right or that, you know, reading Peterson will automatically lead you to that, right? Um, you know, I think it's very, very important to Peterson's work that there's this tension, right, which I described, right, between an ontologi ontological naturalization of inequality and a view that we should develop structures um, which are responsive to that and maybe can improve upon it in certain respects, but are nevertheless limited ontologically, right, uh, you know, by the sort of deep dimension of his work, right? Um, so I, I don't, you know, I don't think that the most natural political position uh, in terms of compatibility with Peterson's work is a far right position. But what I was merely pointing out is that if you look at the particular uh, ontological prominence, right, the autarkic aspect of his work plays in terms of being the real reality that undergirds all kinds of political formations and regulates them, then you can start to understand why some people would view him as very sympathetic to that, right? Or why certain people who read his work might go in that direction, right? You know, and that raises a larger question uh, about his complicity with those cultures, right? Um, but in terms of your, your other point, um, about improving the world. Yeah, I don't mean to suggest that Peterson totally um, outrules the notion that we can improve things, right? I mean, presumably, if he says that he's an advocate for equality of opportunity, right, you know, that's one species of equality that he supports, right? Um, but, you know, what I'm saying is that uh, there are absolute limitations that are assigned to that in terms of what's possible. And ultimately, everything indexes back to a deep, Ontologiz ontologization of inequality. That's, and this is the horizon of what's achievable, right? Um, you know, and he, he says this very, very succinctly time and time again, right? Uh, you know, equality of outcome, whatever that means, right? Because again, it's ex extremely vague as a notion, right? Uh, you know, will lead to catastrophic results. Well, that's interesting too, right? Because, you know, if we look at, um, you know, if we look at, uh, you know, the 20th century, you know, we can debate uh, you know, the morality or, 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 you know, the actions of states like the Soviet Union or China, right? But one thing that's very clear is that in a global perspective that, um, you know, often in order to change, uh, you know, economic inequalities that are, that are deeply embedded as a consequence of historical structures, it's, not, it's, not, it's necessary to actually be radical, right? Um, you know, and I would argue that in many respects, that's the only way in which things are really accomplished, Right. You know, like as with the French Revolution, we could give an example. I mean, we might discuss the foundation of Peterson's liberalism, right? And how that was manifested politically because it wasn't necessarily peaceable, which is another little irony, right? Um, so again, I think there's a, a real naivety, right? You know, in terms of, um, you, know, uh, you know, creating this sort of ontologically fixed, historically insensitive structure, right? And saying that all of our political practice has to index that and uh, function to some degree in accordance with it. Right now, I'm not saying absolutely, right? But to some degree. Uh, can, can I just really quickly add on to that? Yeah, yeah so, uh, so I think that it's, it's certainly true that, uh, that nothing Peterson says entails that, um, that all forms of social change are, are impossible, but it's clearly the case that he um, that he goes out of his way constantly to attribute at least quite a bit of existing uh, inequality and distribution of resources, et cetera, uh, to natural sources. So Marion gave an example about STEM fields earlier, uh, which actually I love that example, especially because if you go back and look at the uh, you know the way people talked about computer programming in the mid twentieth century, it was largely seen as women's work. Uh, uh, you know, and uh, and then there was a later you know shift there in the opposite direction as it became more prestigious. Uh, but um, but certainly with 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 large scale economic inequalities, he constantly makes remarks about like that. That's one of the main purposes for which he uses his uh, favorite animal metaphors, right? Uh, that oh, look at these lobsters, you know, some having much more territory and resources than others. Look at the ants, you know, and and how. Some of them are, you know, doing this work that the other, other, others aren't. Well, that's not because of capitalism and the West and white men. And, you know, he's very, very, very fond of this rhetorical strategy. 
Now, I agree. I think you could agree with a lot of the larger scale things he says and maps of meaning, et cetera, and, and reject all of that, right? Like, I don't think it particularly flows from those sources. Um, he has to have that position. After all, Peterson himself recognizes that at least the specific historical forms that hierarchy has taken have, have shifted, right? In his, in his view for the better, you know, that's more meritocratic, et cetera. Uh, so, so you could certainly agree with a lot of his premises and think that further shifts are possible and desirable, but I do think he's saying something more than just be careful and serious about it when you pursue uh, pursue it, because his critique of equality of outcome, and particularly the way he, he ties that to his critique of the contemporary left, certainly implies that he thinks that Marxist, feminists, etc., are demanding unreasonable forms of equality of outcome that uh, that aren't uh, that could only lead to disaster, and if you make an impotent attempt to create it, given these extremely natural forms of inequality he sees at the base of the human condition. Cool. Okay, um, Nathan, you had a question that got a lot of plus ones. Nathan, you, we can hear you, I think. Oh, you, we can't hear you. You're, one moment. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yep, you're good. All right. Sorry about that. Thank you guys so much for coming on um, and <clears throat> being willing to present a nuanced critical point of view against Peterson. Um, so my question is that a lot of Peterson debate seems to hinge on whether a person senses that Peterson is either, quote, good behind all of his rhetoric and is at bottom seeking to explore and help people, or whether his rhetoric is presenting a facade of good in order to smuggle in a lot of reactionary or tired old views. Um, do you guys also get that same sense? And I, you know, Ben, you were saying that you have had a lot of discussions with people and I, I just gave up on them because uh, it was either like, yay, Peterson is good or boo, Peterson is bad. Like almost every single time, I, the, nobody budged from their, from their initial um, viewpoint. So do you guys also get that same sense about the hinge? Uh, do, you, do you yourselves parse him along those lines and how could we make a reasonable judgment about such a question? Yeah, I mean, just, just uh, real briefly then I'll, I'll throw it to my co-authors. Um, I think a lot of discussion is like that. It's certainly not the kind of discussion I'm interested in. Uh, I think that's probably the least interesting question you could possibly ask about somebody, whether they like are individually virtuous or not. Um, you know, I, I don't know if, you know, whether, I, I think whether Peterson, he clearly has some political views that are at least in a very broad brush sense conservative, right, you know, um, that, that he talks about a lot, even in the self-help writings. Uh, so he clearly has those views. That's not necessarily the same as saying that he has like an evil agenda to smuggle them in, or that everything he says about self-help is bad, or that there aren't people who really benefit from it, right? I'm certainly not interested in Peterson yay or Peterson boo. I'm interested in, okay, he makes, he has these specific ideas, he makes these specific arguments, are they convincing arguments? Are they, are they good ideas? Are parts of them good, other parts bad? If so, what's what? Can I yeah, follow on to that before? Uh, just, just to add directly to what you said there, um, you mentioned, you know, at the beginning, not you, but um, I think Conrad at the beginning mentioned that he sold three million books. And, you know, you can go, to, I can go to my local university and find 15 or 20 people and have a really engaging conversation about these kind of ideas, but these kind of ideas don't sell 3 million books. So it feels to me like there's something else at work, you know, behind or, or beside or, you know, surrounding whatever it is that the philosophical framework maybe helps to give some legitimacy to what he's saying in, in certain people's minds, but that um, maybe, I don't want to say there's something more going on, but uh, that that analysis doesn't exhaust the Peterson phenomenon. Matt, do you want to grab that? 
Yeah, sure. Actually, I suppose I should because um, one of the things that I wrote about was the question of authenticity uh, and moral virtue uh, in Peterson's work. Uh, and I don't say this expressly in the book, but I think that if you want to put it colloquially, there's two stages that you have to go through to assess whether or not someone is a good person uh, in the classical Grecian sense of the word, right? Uh, and the one that I'm more interested in uh, is the second, uh, which is the one that Ben highlighted, right? So the first stage that you have to ask, uh, which is one that Peterson devotes, devotes a great deal of time to analyzing, uh, since it's a more interesting psychological question, is the authenticity of someone's moral viewpoint, right? Do they actually believe what it is that they're saying? Are they committed to it? And how committed are they to this, right? Uh, and in this respect, you know, authenticity has a lot of virtues to it, right? We admire people who are authentically dedicated to causes, uh, but we admire people who are authentically dedicated to causes that we think are worth pursuing, right? Uh, there can be authentic Nazis, there can be authentic people running the Soviet gulags who really believe in their cause, there can be authentic reactionaries, right? Uh, so in the sense that, you know, Peterson is a person of great authenticity, I don't think anyone could deny that, right? He really seems to believe what he's saying, and I think that attests to some of the charisma that Nathan was talking about, right? Uh, he comes across as a man of conviction who really feels that he's speaking to the fundaments of Western civilization and its enemy, and people who want answers to these questions pick up on that and it resonates with them, right? Uh, as to the second and more delicate question that Ben was highlighting, uh, it concerns whether or not what he authentically believes is morally plausible, right? Uh, and that's what I have a lot more issue with, uh, because even though he seems to authentically believe uh, in a lot of these different reactionary convictions, uh, however it is that we want to frame them, I don't think that they all actually hold up to sophisticated moral analysis. Uh, I think actually, if you even look at the liberal tradition as has been articulated through the 20th century, most liberals uh, who looked at the tradition with any severity would say it doesn't hold up to serious moral scrutiny. Uh, and there are a lot of different dimensions to that. Um, so would I characterize him as a good person? I characterize him as a person of tremendous authenticity, great charisma and powerful conviction, uh, but somebody who holds ultimately an implausible and undesirable moral outlook that people of good conscience should reject for a wide variety of different reasons. Uh, well, I would just say that I agree with you, Nathan, in the sense that I do believe that, and that's my problem with Peterson particularly, and I think in the book, there's an introduction by Slavoj Zizek, and Zizek kind of makes this point because he says, the problem with Peterson is not when he lies, but when he hides a truth when he's lying, right? And I think this is a brilliant point made by Jijek, right? I think that, and this is something I tried also to incorporate into my own like a critique, right? That, that, that's, I think, the problem. And I do agree that, and my problem being is with him, at least in relating to your question is, I do think that he hides these very deeply reactionary politics, right? In like this kind of uh, commonsensical things that he's telling you, right? Because when people tell you like, well, if maybe if you want to improve, like you want to make your bed in the morning, right? Like, well, if you, maybe you want to live a more ordered life, you want to do that for your sense, like you accomplish little things, right? I have friends that have gone through like psychological treatment and one of the, like not treatment, but they, they talk to psycho as a psychologist, especially today, right? And what the psychologists have told my friends is like, well, if you don't want to feel this weird, like very deep, pressure about where we're living, try to give yourself little tasks, like right? uh, to, so you feel that you completed task over the day and you, you feel good for yourself, right? And, and this will like, it, you build up on that and will help you there, right? So what I'm saying is, it's not wrong to sometimes tell yourself, do your bed and stuff, right? And the problem is what comes next with Peterson and he tells you, right? Like, well, you don't do your bed because you don't want to be ordered and order is good, etc. And if we look at what's happening today in the US, right? What we are seeing is that not all forms of order are okay, uh, right? Just because we say they are natural, right? Sometimes in order to see something better happening, maybe we come to the moment in which all of the previous order had to crumble, right? And try to kind of grab it and just want to want it to stay the same way for our own personal reasons, right? Is, is bad, or at least I would say it's totally wrong to hide it until like under some pretension of I'm just giving advice, right? Yeah, I actually just wanted to build on this uh, since I touched very briefly on that in that section. Um, and I think that was really, really well put. Uh, uh, good job. Uh, thank you. 
um, it's that he kind of insists on advice that on the surface it seems really commonsensical uh, and actually is individually valid, right? Like uh, having grown up in Toronto as a millennial, I can tell you there are a lot of people I know who should clean their room and will probably benefit from that, right? Uh, you know, as personalized advice, it's not bad. Uh, where I find this problematic is when someone says, you should put your own life in order before trying to change the world. Well, what if your life is in disorder because there are fundamental problems in the world? Uh, and one of the examples I give is if you're not earning enough money to actually live a life of dignity, uh, when Peterson is telling you, don't form a union uh, or don't try to politically change that situation, just try to improve things for yourself, that's highly problematic uh, because one of the best ways you might be able to improve things for yourself and for that matter, improve things for others would be by engaging in social agitation. Uh, and that's where this kind of commonsensical uh, advice uh, becomes problematic and where we should question its political efficacy. Yeah, and I, I, I would just, I would also just add that, um, you know, cause, cause I noticed a couple people that, in the chat were amazed by the assertion that, uh, that Peterson's individual virtue isn't really of interest here. So just to, uh, just to briefly defend that, look, if you wanted somebody to be a friend or a romantic partner or a mentor or a therapist, um, then if then sure, their, their, their individual moral character might be of tremendous interest to you. Uh, if a public figure is making arguments for ideas, um, their individual moral character is of no interest whatsoever, completely irrelevant. Um, I think there's a common popular obsession with this point right now uh, in Western politics, whether somebody is act, is speaking in good faith or in bad faith. Uh, I like Sartre, but this might be his worst legacy. Uh, that uh, does not matter one iota. Somebody who is an insincere bad person, insincerely making arguments, um, might still make a good argument. Right? That's uh, somebody somebody who is extremely sincere, uh, and and is and 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 is and is and is an extremely virtuous person might make terrible arguments. Somebody who has a uh, somebody who who wants wants only good might be endorsing vile ideas, right? They have uh, so I think rather than trying to to look into Peterson's heart, which is impossible in any case for those of us who don't know him, uh, we should we should evaluate his ideas as they are. Could I get could I get Raven Connolly uh, Connolly's question here? Could I take that, Peter? Sure. Okay. Um, so Raven Connolly writes here. Should I read the question or? Uh, Raven, do you want to unmute yourself and ask it? Uh, I didn't really frame it as a question, but however you are taking it, go for it. <laughs> okay. I thought it was a question um, because there is a question mark in there. I see. Um, yeah, um, I think what's very interesting is the way that um, if you look at uh, maps of meaning, uh, part of what Peterson does um, is, uh, you know, and apropos is kind of Jungian influence, uh, he, takes, um, he takes these sort of narratives, right? These archetypal uh, narratives uh, and he maps them onto, uh, you know, cognitive biology, essentially, right? Um, and he focuses on certain, this has already been written about actually in psychology today, right? He focuses on certain kinds of narratives, right? Um, you know, that, you know, in which there's sort of a hero's journey and so forth, right? We could talk about the Odyssey or we could talk about the Bhagavad Gita and things like this. And while these do uh, persist across different cultures, um, you know, what's interesting is that, uh, you know, from an anthropological standpoint, I think it's broadly understood <clears throat> that this kind of narrative structure is characteristic of, uh, post-agricultural societies in general, right? Uh, and also, you know, with post-agriculture and animal domestication, we tend to get, um, you know, the rise of patriarchal structures, right? Um, so I think it's interesting because to talk about this view of, of, of the Rousseauian notion of nature, right, versus a Hobbesian view of nature, or um, Peterson has to, uh, you know, for all of this to be plausible, right? Um, he has to, to pedal very hard across his books to try to discredit uh, you know, any notion of nature that would disagree uh, with his ontological uh, naturalization of inequality. Uh, so, for example, the entire um, sort of uh, tradition that runs through uh, Bakoffin and Lewis Henry Morgan and so forth, uh, that talks about the idea that societies were matrilocal or matrilineal uh, prior to the development of agriculture is dismissed, just totally offhand. There isn't, it's not much of an argument uh, by Peterson. Uh, Rousseau is dismissed. 
Um, you know, and what's interesting about this is that it seems to me that, you know, perhaps far more interesting than this debate in of itself uh, is the way that uh, these conceptions of nature, nature index to uh, uh, different political positions, right? Um, so, you know, you can, the, the reality is, right, you can find, like, you know, I mean, I, I tend to think that, um, you know, class and, and wealth inequality, well, I think this is, is demonstrable or a consequence of certain changes that emerged perhaps in the 10% in the most recent part of uh, human evolutionary history. Um, of course, there's some dispute over those matters. But the point is, you can find all kinds of examples uh, in nature uh, to rationalize different political views. Right, so Peterson cites Jane Goodall's work on chimps, and he says, "Well, chimps are horrible, and they kill each other, and you know this is what nature is, right?" And it's like, well, if you're left, you can just go cite Bonobos, right? I mean, it's not that you know. There's always a counterpoint, right? So it's not terribly convincing in the end, um, you know. And I think, uh, you know, in a lot of respects, uh, or at least with respect to Peterson, that it can be more interesting to analyze again uh, these conceptualizations of nature with respect to. Uh, the general political and ideological agenda that he's putting forth. Yeah. Do you have any follow-up to that, Ryan? Um, yeah, but I don't know. Maybe we could save it for the sense-making session later on today. Okay, cool. We'll, we'll plug that at the, at the end. Um, so, uh, Rogelio, uh, you had a question about what is a, a morals in emergent biology. Could you uh, unmute yourself and, and read that? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Uh, yeah, I just had a quick question on getting your guys' opinion on, on Peterson's case of the, for emergent morale, for morality emerging from biology. And what did you guys think of that? And also just curious, what uh, moral structures are you guys operating from? Just to kind of see the different points of view. I mean, I guess I would say that uh, some moral impulses probably do have, uh, almost certainly, right, do have, have biological sources. Uh, some don't, right? So, um, so, so, so it could be that, you know, some of our deepest moral intuitions uh, are ones that anybody uh, who shared our biology would have. Um, and some of them might come from, from cultural sources or other things. Uh, but I, I don't, in a sense, I don't think it's a very interesting question, right? Because I think that, because um, I think like no matter which ones come from which source, right? You know, that like, oh, uh, these, these deeply held moral intuitions uh, are an inheritance from evolution. These, these ones, you know, come from, from, from culture, from whatever, right, you know, wherever else they might come from. Uh, I don't think it would ever make sense to say, oh, well, we'll embrace the ones that come from the right sources and we'll reject the ones that, that come from, from the wrong sources. Um, I, and the, the reason uh, I, I don't think that, uh, I, and I'm trying to think how to, how to put this as succinctly as possible so as not to be a total bore and like talk uh, you know, for the next 10 minutes, you know, without uh, my co-authors getting in on it, but uh, has to do with David Hume's point about facts and values. Um, so, uh, they, so empirical facts can only ever tell us how to implement our normative goals, right? That they, that they could be terribly relevant to that, right? Like, okay, we care about bringing about greater equality, whatever it is we care about, right? then we can start looking at empirical facts, like, oh, what's worked in the past, what hasn't worked, you know, um, what, are the, what are the sort of limitations built in uh, by, by various empirical issues, and those can be tremendously relevant, uh, but the one thing that the facts can't do is tell us what to care about in the first place, um, and so I'm, I'm deeply skeptical of the idea that there's anything that we could appeal to outside of our most deeply held moral intuitions in order to, in order to justify them. That, you know, that we say, like, you can say, oh, why do you care about X? I can justify it in terms of Y if Y is some other goal that I care about even more deeply than I care about X. But once you get down to why do you care about the things that you care about most deeply, uh, I just kind of see that as a pseudo question. But um, my but my co-authors might have totally different views on this. 
Oh, could, could I just real quick clarify yeah. that? Because, because at least from what I understand it, is that his main belief of the source of morals is that they arise from, at least in part, uh, from a projection of the hierarchy, right? And that the certain behaviors naturally promotes, you know, uh, competence and climbing of a hierarchy. And that kind of has these weird invisible rules that aren't fully articulated or clarified. They're more patterns of behavior that we conceptualize as rules. So I guess to that extent, if, you know, fully full argument that that couldn't be the case, right? But if that were the case, wouldn't that be a, an example of where facts could actually define a morality because it's kind of a self-introspection into the moral, into the very concept of why we have a concept of morality. Yeah, so I would make a distinction there between saying that uh, that empirical facts uh, can be can be informative for the descriptive question of why it is that we care about the things that we most deeply care about, but I would make a distinction between that question and the question of why we should care about the things that we most deeply care about. So uh, the first question, absolutely, that's a, that, that is a question for the empirical psychologist, the anthropologist, the biologist even, right? Sure, absolutely. Um, but, any, I, but what I'm skeptical about is that any answers to those questions are going to be relevant to the, uh, to the, the ought questions, the, uh, the, the what should we care about the most. Yeah, I broadly agree with that kind of framework. The way I identify uh, following someone like Derek Parkfit is as a quasi-cognitive realist. Uh, and to try to unpack that a little bit, I do agree that a lot of our basic moral feelings uh, or our moral sentiments, to use the classical term, probably do have a biological or a naturalistic basis, right? Uh, they emerge, you know, in conscious beings that have evolved over a long period of time to have certain sentiments, uh, and studying them can be of great interest, right? Uh, now, saying that, just because we have certain moral sentiments uh, that emerge in conscious beings doesn't really tell us very much about which moral sentiments are appropriate or what kind of rational programs or rational imperatives that we should derive from these sentiments, right? And this is where the realist element comes in. Uh, because I think that once we try to use reason to ascertain what kind of moral codes we should follow, they have an independent status that's not beholden uh, to how we feel about them. And what I think is actually a much more interesting question uh, than just what are our feelings about morality is actually context. Uh, and people like Henry Sidgwick were aware of this as far back as the 19th century, where we might have very strong and compelling moral reasons to do something that operates against our sentiments. Uh, Sidgwick characterized this as the profoundest problem in ethics, right? Oftentimes we might have compelling rational reasons to do something that we really don't want to do. Uh, and that actually feels wrong uh, to us emotionally. Uh, but nonetheless, if we look at it from a more impartial perspective, it seems like we have very good, compelling moral reasons to do it. Um, and in his case, Cedric was talking about the necessity to put aggregate utility over ahead of individual utility, right? Uh, and these kinds of questions aren't things that can be answered by looking just at moral sentiments uh, from whatever level of analysis that you think is appropriate, right? You can only answer them by using different analytical tools uh, than what an empirical scientist uh, or philosophical psychologists have available to them, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I would just, I would just say, you know, just real quickly, so we don't turn our Romanian time into a debate about metaethics. Uh, that uh, that would be a lot of fun, though. Sure, another time for sure. Uh, but uh, that I'd say that that what that more impartial perspective from which we can reject some of our sentiments amounts to ultimately has to come down to what Rawls calls reflective equilibrium, which means that what we're doing is we're looking at different sentiments uh, that, that seem to point in different directions, and we're going through this process of trying to make, trying to figure out how to cohere them together into an internally consistent framework, which may, might mean at the end of it, you have to throw some of them out, right? That's fine, right? But ultimately what's going on there still has, in my view, right, that I'd, I'd still go with the very human view about that, has has sentiment at the base of it, right? Like, like, like it, it's it at the end, it's it's an elaborate form of, of of throwing out some things we care about because we care about something else even more deeply. Yeah, absolutely. We're trying to rationalize or create a hierarchy of uh, rationalizations for our moral sentiments, right? Uh, and this should be done as impartially as possible, uh, but ultimately, it does arise from a conviction that we should be good, 
right? Uh, in some strange sense of the word, right? And we can talk about that later on, but uh, that's why I think quasi-cognitivist realism is the way to go, Ben. No. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, can I can I hop yeah. in and just just say something? I want to because the the idea of competence hierarchies was brought up. Uh, and I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on the historical and ideological context of Peterson's work. Uh, of course, Peterson talks about, uh, you know, certainly he naturalizes the idea of competence hierarchies, right? Uh, though I think he only says it's, it's the case amongst animals with higher level nervous systems that competence hierarchies exist. Um, and what's interesting about this uh, as regards competence hierarchies uh, is that um, this notion uh, that nature is defined by competence hierarchies emerges uh, more or less specifically uh, within the context of uh, bourgeois capitalist society, right? Um, so, you know, it's very interesting, right? If you look at, um, if you look at uh, Sciences Po, right, the university, elite university in France, right, the, the founder of it, Emile Boutigny, I believe, uh, he gave a speech when it was founded, and he basically said that, you know, as Republican forms of governance have ushered in greater levels of equality, us, the upper class, we're no longer just going to be able to depend on our status anymore. Right, that we have to attach to our status in order to defend it. Right, uh, certain tangible capacities that can differentiate us from the, the other members of society. Um, you know, and I think uh, you can see the way that this is is very much uh, part of the genus of of bourgeois society. I mean, of course, you could look at uh, uh, you know the uh, you know if you look at Darwin, right, in terms of how he conceptualizes natural selection, and Marx observes this. Darwin ends up being very influenced by Malthus. Right, um, you know, and uh, this aspect of Darwin's work ends up being play, play, you know, the sort of survival of the fittest, uh, sort of vulgar interpretation of Darwin's work, ends up being played up more heavily than it even is represented, um, you know, in Darwin's work. So his cousin Francis Galton, right, you know, he really stresses this, um, you know, uh, sort of uh, social Darwinian dimension, right, you know, that then becomes very, very popular within the 20th century. Um, but of course, the difficulty with all of this, right, is that, you know, uh, it is the case, right, that within a society such as ours, uh, that hierarchies are based partially on competence, right? Um, you know, I, I think it would have been unthinkable for someone living in the Ancien Regime in France, right, you know, to think that hierarchies were really based on competence. But today, there's enough of it, right, uh, that it can be defended. Uh, but, you know, I think what we have to understand is that um, you know, like, say you come from a very, very wealthy country, right, typically a white country, right, you know, then because that country is wealthy, you're going to have better access to education, and then you're going to be more educated, right, so it's actually very, very hard, right, uh, you know, to separate out uh, hierarchies of competence from, from, from hierarchies of power, right, and in a certain sense, the idea of a, of a competence hierarchy is something that's ideologically used to defend the inequalities that exist today, so this is why someone like Foucault will say, you know, uh, we, have, we have to look at power knowledge, right? Uh, because power, you know, in the context of our society, uh, you know, is always uh, defended, uh, you know, through the transmission of knowledge, uh, you know, and, and through an appeal to the notion of knowledge and competency, right? Um, if, if it's okay, uh, there's a there's question, it was, it was asked a while ago by, uh, by Matthew MacGyver, uh, that that I'd, I'd I'd really love to engage with before we ended. Sure, uh, you, Matthew, would you want to unmute yourself uh, and ask your question? Or or Ben, if you know it. Um, sure. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> if you can just. Sure. Uh, well, it's the one. It's it's in uh, four forty seven in the chat. Um, it's uh, and uh, it's a long chat comment, so I won't read the whole thing. But um, but the the last part was was. Um, I don't say Marxism is rooted in classically liberal principles, it's not individualist, rarely manifests as liberal. Marxism is reactionary to the outcomes of classical liberal principles. That's why ideology built on Marxism tend to focus on outcomes. I could be confused. Maybe Mr. Burgess could expand on how he thinks um, Marxism is meaningfully classically liberal. Uh, I would like to chime in on that once you're done also. Good. Yep. Um, <laughs> uh, so, okay. Sorry, I was just laughing because it, it occurred to me that I could I could assert the competence hierarchy here and say Dr. Burgess, damn it. But uh, I, uh, but in any case, um, look, I think uh, I think that um, 
So, so it's certainly true that many people uh, have done extremely illiberal things uh, in, in the name of Marx's ideas historically. There's no doubt whatsoever about that. Uh, I do think that we tend to have some weird double standards about this. Uh, so to, uh, to illustrate that, uh, so um, most of the most important libertarian figures of the 20th century uh, supported uh, Pinochet's dictatorship in Chile. Uh, which had an extremely bloody reign of terror for anti-communist reasons. Um, so Milton Friedman actually gave gave uh, gave Pinochet, you know, like flew down to Chile to give Pinochet economic advice and wrote him a glowing letter letter about it. Uh, you know, um, you know Hayek, you know, uh, had uh, actually um, wrote extensively in justification of him, etc. The same way that some Marxist intellectuals, you know, defended uh, Stalin's Russia. Uh, and in fact, if you go back to look at the at the roots of these things, I think the contrast gets really striking because some of the big classical liberals like John Locke and John Stuart Mill uh, were themselves directly involved in some of the greatest and most illiberal atrocities of their era. Uh, John Locke wrote in defense of both slavery uh, and the dispossession of the Native Americans uh, and was directly involved in both insofar as he helped write the Constitution for the South Carolina uh, colony, uh, John Stuart Mill, um, important classical liberal figure, worked for the British East India Company, you know, doesn't get much more illiberal than that, and also wrote philosophical justification for British rule in India in On Liberty. Um, whereas uh, Karl Marx, uh, people who seem to give Locke and Mill a pass for their illiberal political activities, uh, blame Karl Marx for what people who were born after he died did in his name, uh, even though Marx himself never uh, never wrote in justification uh, of um, of undemocratic uh, regimes, you know his idea of the dictatorship, of the proletariat, and the rule of labor. His go-to example was the ultra-democratic Paris Commune of uh, of 1871. The only head of state he ever thought it well enough of to even write him a friendly letter was Abraham Lincoln. Um, so, so that's on the, the part about it, about how it's manifested itself as far as the question of individualism, uh, whereas Marx doesn't have an explicit normative history, you know, theory one way or the other, right? You know, he clearly has normative commitments, right? But like he doesn't, he doesn't, he's not a, he's not a moral philosopher. He's, he doesn't theorize about ethics. Um, but uh, he does actually clearly not advocate absolute equality of outcome. I read Critique of the Goth Program, chapter one. Um, and I'll just leave it at that for the sake of brevity, right? So I want to let Matt talk. Uh, but as far as the individualism question, I do think, in fact, that uh, if, you know, Marx is not uh, an ethical theorist, you know, he's a hist you know, historical and sociological theorist, uh, but certainly if you look at the kind of normative theory that, that could provide a basis uh, for an ethical commitment to socialism, uh, I mentioned Rawls earlier, John Rawls, Theory of Justice, uh, and I think that, um, and I think that a good, uh, that, so Rawls's starting point uh, is that everybody has the same moral status. So a just society is the kind that you would design if you didn't know who you were going to be in that society. You wouldn't know whether you'd be born into a rich family or a poor family. For that matter, you wouldn't know whether you were going to be extremely talented or extremely untalented. So pure meritocratic uh, distributions uh, wouldn't particularly appeal to you doesn't necessarily mean that you'd have to have absolute equality of outcome. He talks about other factors that you might weigh against that. Uh, but it does mean that you know, you'd, you'd want a society that you'd want to live in regardless of any factors outside of your control. And that, and that sort of thing actually does strike me as providing us with, 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 a, with a good reason to criticize capitalism and support some sort of democratic socialism. Yeah, and I just wanted to follow up with that and say that uh, this is actually one of the points where I find there's a bit of an ugly side to Petersonian analysis and the kind of broader uh, IDW analysis that you see, uh, whereas Ben mentioned, they're far more willing to forgive figures uh, in the history of political thought, Western political thought particularly, uh, who reach conclusions that they find palatable uh, than those who actually weren't responsible for many of the atrocities carried out in their name, uh, but nonetheless, they find their conclusions unpalatable. Uh, and just to bring it back to Peterson, one of the things that I point out is uh, he's very willing to forgive Nietzsche. Uh, this is the same Nietzsche who used to say things like, well, if several million people die in the 20th century, uh, that's an acceptable loss to produce a more interesting kind of environment. Uh, who famously chimed in, thus spoke Zarathustra, goest thou to woman, make sure you bring a whip, right? 
Uh, and he's also very willing to forgive Martin Heidegger, who unlike Marx, uh, actually did support a totalitarian party while he was alive, uh, the Nazi party, right? He was very, like, vigorously involved. He tattled to the Gestapo about uh, you know, various people who are in university programs about how they weren't German enough. And uh, you find very little mention of that uh, in Peterson's work, uh, much as you don't find a lot of references to the crimes committed by various classical liberals uh, in the work of the IDW more generally, right? Uh, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't read Marx or, or Heidegger or Nietzsche uh, or Locke or Kant on that basis. Uh, what we need to do is, of course, extract what's valuable from their work uh, while sadly chucking the rest uh, as either an unfortunate relic of history uh, or just a very bad conclusion that they reached uh, that wasn't really supported by anything other than their own prejudices uh, and, and negative inclinations, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And oh, by the way, real quickly, I just realized I never actually connected the dots with my last comment, right, about Rawls and individualism, that that Rawlsian framework that I just mentioned is still one that, it, that if what you mean by individualism is seeing discrete individuals as the relevant unit of moral evaluation, uh, unlike, for example, utilitarianism, which is actually collectivist in the sense that you're, you're aggregating happiness and not worrying about how it's distributed among individuals, uh, then Rawlsianism is, is morally individualist, right? Uh, Rawls, you know, Rawls's concern is how any given form of social organization, what it would be like to live in it as one of the least well-off members of that society. So even though his conclusions are very different than, um, than, than libertarians or working conservatives or anything, it's not because he's less morally concerned with individuals. Yeah, and actually this is one of the things that I want to talk about also since I'm a Rawlsian at heart, right? Uh, although my own esoteric way. Um, and when it comes to the point about Marx, right, I actually think Marx very much belongs uh, in what you call the broader Western canon, which includes liberalism, uh, in part because Marx, rather like many of uh, his liberal progenitors, uh, was very concerned with freedom, first and foremost, right? Uh, one of the odd things, if you read Marx, whenever he actually talks about his own normative commitments, uh, which, as Ben pointed out, is infrequently, uh, he almost always talks about things in terms of freedom, the development of your personality, uh, not living in an exploitative system where you're rendered powerless, uh, rather than in terms of the necessity for strict equality per se. Uh, and this comes from the fact that Marx uh, was highly influenced from Hegel early on, right? Uh, who was very much a kind of conservative liberal thinker, uh, who Marx radicalized along with others in the Hegelian movement. Uh, and Hegel's entire point was that, you know, in society you want the freedom to develop various sides of your personality in as robust a fashion as possible. Uh, you know, this is putting it very simply, uh, since, of course, uh, Hegel, Hegel is famously difficult to know. Uh, when it comes to what I think our own normative commitments should be, uh, I agree with somebody like Rawls, right? I don't even think you can talk about us living in a meritocracy uh, when it's patently obvious that many people enjoy tremendous advantages uh, from birth, right? Uh, and other people are extremely disadvantaged from birth. Uh, and this can include things from their social status, right? What kind of family you're born into, what kind of advantages your parents are going to give you, or what kind of disadvantages they're going to give you. Uh, but it can also point, come to, or sorry, uh, relate to things like natural abilities, right? Uh, one of the things that people like Charles Murray like to talk about is say, well, we should live in a, in a meritocracy uh, defined by IQ, right? The smartest people should rise to the top or they will rise to the top and there's nothing wrong with that. Well, in my account, that's not a meritocracy, right? If winning a genetic, genetic lottery allows you to get to the top, you don't merit that. You happen to be lucky enough to be born with that. Uh, and the Rawlsian point is that you shouldn't feel bad about this, uh, but you should recognize that you are lucky enough to be born with certain gifts and be willing to redistribute some of what you've gained on their behalf to those who, through no, mis uh, through no fault of their own, happen to be less fortunate than you are. Uh, and I think that's the appropriate thing to do. And it's also the liberal thing to do if you take things like the moral equality of individuals and fairness seriously, uh, which our society, I'm afraid to say, does not uh, in any serious respect. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, I guess, I, I just very briefly chime in that, um, you know, I think that, I think that if by meritocracy, uh, you mean uh, a a society in which the primary way of distributing resources is according to a hierarchy of competence, right, is is a hierarchy based on variations in natural talents, uh, then of course one we obviously don't live in a society with the slightest resemblance to that but right? um, you know I, I think that um, like Twitter is very useful for illustrating this uh, how the uh, mental quality of a lot of our richest plutocrats 
Uh, and uh, two, um, it wouldn't be a desirable one to live in anyway, right? As Matt says, right? Just just to put a very um, uh, just to just to uh, lower the level of discourse here, I'll say that uh, uh, my wife and I just watched the classic 1997 science fiction film Gattaca the other night, and that uh, that seems like a good illustration of why a genuinely meritocratic society, in, in the sense of a society of where distribution uh, is along the lines of uh, of classical of of variations in natural talents, would be a dystopia. Yeah, good film though. Uh, definitely yes. worth watching. Can I just uh, can I just say something? Um, uh, if we have a bit, if we have a couple minutes, um, I just wanted to say first of all, uh, just uh, with respect to what you're you're saying about Marx um, and individuality, uh, it seems to me that there is a, you know, the problem of this with Marx is always like, in a certain sense, in Marx's early work, uh, you know, different, albeit uh, in a genre similar to Peterson in a certain sense, uh, is that he does have. Uh, you know, a, uh, a biologistic view of, of, of morality in a certain sense, right? Um, and this is because of the daddy as to Feuerbach, right? Uh, so Feuerbach, uh, you know, understands Hegel's dialectic, you know, in relation to the, the, the biology of the human itself, right? Uh, so the things that are portrayed as dialectical movements uh, in Hegel uh, become a question of biology. Um, and Marx sort of structures his work in that way, like the struggle for socialism is about overcoming the alienation of the individual. Um, but in around the mid 1840s, there's a shift, right? Where Marx pivots and he starts to focus more on uh, the way that notions of individuality uh, and agency, for example, are structured by uh, socioeconomic formations. Um, and, you know, in Capital, we see that, uh, you know, the historical unfolding of value in economic systems becomes quite decisive. So he says, well, the freedom characteristic of Protestantism is appropriate to a society of individual commodity producers and so forth. Um, you know, and that certainly opens the door to a broader critique of notions of, of, of uh, liberalism or humanism uh, in terms of how they can be ideologically deployed uh, in the present uh, or in Ma Marx's time. So people go in different directions in this, like Michel Henry tries to explain all of Marxism with respect to individual phenomenology, um, reading the earlier work, whereas someone like Louis Althusser will say, well, um, Marx is totally anti-humanist and there's a scientific Marxism that dissolves these notions uh, and so on. And I also just want to say one other thing. Um, I believe uh, Raven said, how do we distinguish uh, competency from merit? Um, and I think uh, one thing, again, uh, from a Marxist perspective is that, uh, you know, if you think of our society economically, um, you know, this is one way of looking at it, right? Um, you know, there's a certain inequality about the fact that, you know, if someone has capital and they start a business, right, that they're able to appropriate the value you create right? Um, you know, and were it the case that you didn't have a system, right, in which, you know, uh, you have people in McDonald's working for minimal wages, you have, you know, shareholders in McDonald's owning Ferraris and so forth, the people actually would be rewarded far more based on merit, right, because they'd be re being remunerated for, you know, for something approximating the actual value of their work, right? Um, so I think Marx's point in that respect is that uh, the capitalist mode of, of production uh, is actually incompatible uh, with a, a, a truly merit-based focus. I just wanted to... Make I, just, I just want to say something. Uh, this should be our last share because we do have to close out. Okay. Did, did you want to... Uh... Oh, yeah, no, no. I just wanted to answer that question quickly. Um, one of the things where I think we can distinguish competence from merit is competence is fundamentally just how good you are at something, right? Uh, and there are a lot of different dimensions and formal competencies that somebody might have, right? Uh, and they're rewarded by the market in fairly arbitrary ways, um, sometimes in less arbitrary ways, depending upon the skills that one might develop. Uh, but what we understand typically when we talk about merit, uh, it goes back to an earlier question of what someone deserves, right? Uh, and I think this is where people like Rawls and myself have a fundamental problem with the kind of association uh, people make between a competence hierarchy uh, and when we're the deserving or the worthy rise to the top. Because uh, my argument would be, Yes, uh, while it might be the case that people with high levels of competence in fields that the market happens to reward, and here I think Conrad is correct, right, uh, might rise to the top, that doesn't mean that they're particularly worthy in any meaningful sense of the word, uh, particularly if they get ahead merely because they have gifts that were distributed to them through the happenstance of nature or because they have des uh, had certain advantages from the beginning. Uh, if what you really want to talk about was a meritocracy, our society would look radically different than it does right now. Uh, so radically different, actually, 
uh, that would probably fill Peterson with nightmares uh, because it would involve massive forms of disorder to try to establish anything approximating a meritocracy uh, in the sense that any moral theory uh, would find appropriate, right? Uh, so I think if we're going to actually have a serious debate about capitalism versus liberal socialism or Marxism or what it happens to be, uh, we need to start from the standpoint that whatever capitalism is and whatever hierarchy competencies are, uh, they are not meritocratic, uh, right? In fact, it's a perversion of the notion of merit uh, to consider them such. Cool. I, I, have, I have a sense Ben wants to respond, but we have to, we have to stop right there. No, okay. Um, so uh, thank you uh, for coming today. This was, that was a really juicy discussion. I think uh, the chat was like uh, blowing up. I don't know, some philosophical culture wars are going in there or something. Um, so we would definitely love to have you guys come back. I know, Conrad, you, you mentioned something about Stoicism and Marx and stuff. So that, that sounds right up our alley. So we would love to um, have a future session. Would love to um, and uh, yeah, and uh, Peterson actually mentioned you guys, or at least Ben, in the uh, his latest newsletter. Uh, ben, so I ben forwarded Matt, that to, their article, yeah. Yeah, so I forwarded that to, to Con uh, Conrad, so you guys should check that out. Um, so yeah, the symposium continues. We're gonna have a brief break, and then we're gonna watch uh, the documentary together. And we, we tried it, it actually looks pretty good, so it's, uh, the quality's good. And that is, um, the, was it The Rise of Jordan Peterson? Um, the filmmakers here right now, I, I don't wanna put on the spot too much, but Patricia, if you're there, I'll, I'll wait a brief moment if you want to unmute yourself and just plug it a little bit. Uh, Hi, we're here. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Are we muted? Yeah, we're okay. unmuted. Okay. Plug it. Oh, you plug it. Uh, so it's at in a 25 minutes, I guess. Um, yeah. How many people haven't seen it? Show of hands. I haven't seen it. Oh, cool. Okay, good. Okay. Um, yeah, it's... Um, what to say about the film? It's uh, our point with, well, what's your point with the film director? Sure. I'll, I'd say that, um, so the film was, the film, we finished filming, um, what, beginning of 2019. And initially we were kind of gonna stop filming like right around the time when Jordan started his book tour. So, you know, a lot of it is um, framed from before that, but but the main thread running through it all for me was thinking about the culture war that was brewing underneath it and the polarization. So that's a lot of the lens that we were looking at it through. Very cool. So we're going to uh, watch the film. We're gonna have like an afterwards, we're gonna have a QA and a with uh, the two filmmakers. And then Raven, uh, everyone's favorite blackbird at the STOA is going to be running that sense-making session. Raven, could you just uh, meet yourself and kind of say how that's gonna, Go down. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, I think as anybody can tell who's been looking at the chat, there's a lot of um, content here to do some sense making on. So I'll be hosting a sense making session. And if you don't know the lingo, that just means we're going to have a conversation. <laughs> That's what the cool um, kids have, call it. <laughs> that's what the cool, whatever, who cares? Um, but yeah, so we're going to have a discussion about some of the different ideas and viewpoints that have been coming up today um, throughout the symposium. And I will also be uh, really holding the frame um, in this conversation so we don't get off the rails. So yeah, I would definitely invite everybody to come. I think everybody's perspective is valuable here. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Raven. Can I, can I just add something about the Peterson documentary? Uh, because of the, uh, the sort of uh, protests against it uh, and some of the censure, I was really expecting when I, I did watch it, uh, some sort of uh, pro-Peterson work of ideology. But I was quite impressed uh, by the nuance of the representations in the film. So to everyone here, I do encourage uh, them to, to check out the film after this. I, I think it was quite good work. Awesome. Uh, Pete, Peter, can you, uh, can you forward me that newsletter? This is the first I'm hearing about this. Yeah, I sent it, I emailed it to Conrad, so he can maybe... I'll forward it, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you, Conrad. <laughs> I would love to watch the movie, I should say, uh, but I have one final class to teach this semester, and it's three hours, and the students are expecting me to give them their grades at the end of it. Uh, so I will not be here, but I will watch it at some point, because I've heard it's good, so... Just, just screen it to the class, all the class, forget the, the last... Uh... <laughs> okay, and well, then... All the but... assignments are done, yeah. We're just going to and... watch it. And after that, we at uh, eight thirty, we have Akira the Don. He does this a uh, meaning wave. He takes Peterson's voice and all the other self help kind of people, and he makes these cool music with it. So we're gonna have a talk with him for thirty minutes, and we're gonna jump on another link and just dance together. So that being said, um, again, uh, the speakers today, thank you so much, and thanks everyone for the excellent questions. Uh, see you in a, a couple minutes. Uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you.